So welcome back to the Christians in Sport podcast. Uh, we're bang in the middle of the football season. It's up and running. And in this series, we're diving in to chat to players, coaches, leaders in the game, really experienced people who know every level of professional football. My guest today is a real old pal of mine, proper pal, Steve Spooner, currently lead professional development coach at Birmingham City, primarily working with the clubs under 18s, and has been doing that since 2006, so that's quite a stint. And if you think that's a stint, listen to this. He was a professional footballer as a player for two decades, started as a teenager with Derby County in what's now the Premier League in 78, played over 450 football league matches for Halifax, Chesterfield, Hereford, York, Rotherham, Mansfield, Blackpool and Rushton. Now that's a list, but he kept going. He he just kept playing. He played till he was like late 30s, played non-league for Rushton and the football league for them, Burton Albion and Gresley. So you're talking a guy who's been in professional football for over 40 years. Uh, Spoons hung up his boots for good when he became youth team manager at Rushton. He was promoted to first team coach there. And in that season, uh, they went up. They got promoted uh, that year. And in 2004, he took over at Notts County at the youth team and was first team coach there as well before going to Birmingham City in 2006. And on his watch... Birmingham have twice reached the semi-finals of the FA Youth Cup, which is pretty prestigious and very hard to do unless you're a very top, top money team. And he's done that twice, uh, not not least this year, 2009 and 2018. Hey, Spoons, uh, welcome to the Christian Sport Podcast. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> top man. No, no I've, got start, I've got to start here, Spoons. Uh, you're at Chelsea as a kid. They pick you up and become a schoolboy at Chelsea. You, you, you live in that neck of the woods. Uh, you go to Chelsea. Uh, and incredibly, really, uh, before you're 16 years of age, I know it sounds sensational, but it's a, it's an incredible tale. Your mum, you're the apple of her eye. You're the youngest child in your family. Uh, and it was your mum. How do you cope with that as a 15-year-old kid? Well, if I'm honest, I don't know, I really did struggle. Um, I had the, the support of my siblings around me who were, were married at the time. Um, but obviously, you know, you, you have to come home to the house on your own when everybody else is at work. And that was the big thing that really hit me when I first, when it first happened, the coming home and the emptiness of the house. I was used to a, a warm smile and, um, you know, it's me mum just who's love. And uh, to come home to that empty house and then it's funny because whenever I smell Camay soap now, it always reminds me of mum because that was in a house at the time. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I was absolutely devastated. But, um, you know, like the wonderful will of human beings, you find a way to cope. Um, some of the strategies I use wouldn't be advisable now, um, but I had no basis, you know, it's a, no real experience other than I, uh, probably a year, 18 months before that, I'd lost my nephew in a cop death, um, which was very sad as well. Um, so we then get hit with this double whammy that, that sends you sideways and, um, you know, I, I lost the focus of, of football. I'd I'd been out for a while with Osgood Salatras for nearly six months with that as well. Um, and then when something major hits you, you tend to lose focus on everything, um, which I did with football school. Um, and then, you know, through the, the support of the family, I... I managed to get back to school, but it was tough. It, it really was tough, you know. And um, you know, then then days are, are always actually in my mind now. Um, and um, you know, it's it's there, there's still a part of me that that's never recovered. You know, even at uh, my age now, with three grandchildren myself, it's um, had a major impact and a major focus on me life. As did as did my mum. <laughs> Spoons, the remarkable thing, uh, uh, as we do this podcast for people who are thinking about faith or established in faith or anywhere in between, 
involved in elite sport and really competitive sport. Uh, for me, the striking thing is that because you had Osgood Slatters, so you hadn't been playing, you had, your mum dies, you come home to an empty house, as you say. No wonder at that point you don't get uh, a schoolboy, uh, you don't get an apprenticeship at Chelsea. That's pretty understandable. And yet, very shortly indeed afterwards, you're at Derby County as an apprentice professional. You've moved from London up north on your own. Mentally, that's an, you know, for parents of young players and people in performance pathways, you've got to be born with that. I mean, your spoon's the ability to just move away and do that with that kind of pressure. Yeah, I, th- I think when I look back, I didn't realise it at the time, but I, I think I surprised myself because, um, you know, as part of my pro licence, we had to do a, a study on a chosen subject and uh, and I did my study on resilience. And when I was studying it, there was you know, certain things in there that I saw myself and, you know, the, the, the study I found that, is very few people are born resilient, rather they're shaped by what's happening in their world at the time. And then it's your response to the whatever is causing the, the issue. And, uh, of course, that was what gave me a, a resilience that I never had before because, you know, I was, made no bones about it, I was spoiled. You know, youngest of four, um, Breakfast in bed every morning, you know, and and that kind of thing. And then when you got to get up and do it yourself, it's a major shock. But um, no, I found something in myself which I, I, if I put my hand on my heart, I couldn't say at the time. I realised that it was resilience. I didn't know it. It was something. Well, what are you going to do? You know, you want to be a footballer. I had the chance to go to Millwall, Gillingham, or Tottenham on trial. But um, there was a, a coach called Dario Grady who had who'd been at Chelsea when I was there and he moved to Derby County. So he knew about me and a couple of the other players and, and they was in a similar boat, got released. And uh, we all three of us went up and um, two of us were successful, one wasn't. Mm-hmm. But it was, yeah, it was a, a time of... You know, if we look back when we were all 14, 15, you're all over the place anyway. So, but to be hit sideways with that kind of shock was was incredible. Um, and at that time, I was on a journey of, of faith. I didn't know what it was. Mm. Um, and the story is incredible because in the build-up to my mum dying, I had, I'd been thinking about when I die, you know, what is going to happen to me. And um, And Spoons, let me just come in there then, because that is a pretty remarkable thing to say, because when your mum died of a brain tumour, I mean, it was immediate, it was like three weeks, so you didn't, you had no warning about this, so are you saying, because you didn't come from any kind of church background, were you thinking about God before that then, as a kid? Well, I don't know if I was thinking about God, but I was thinking about eternity, Um, and um, I thought, well... You know, I just, there will be another world. Well, where is this other world? Where is it? And all, all these questions that was uh, being raised in my head. And and I remember I, I turned into selfish prayers, like, you know, please let the, that girl fancy me. And uh, <laughs> please let me win a game of football. And, and my brother actually said to me one day, he said, I've seen you praying before the game. What's all that about? I said, well, I want to win. And um, and it's that 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 was oh that's light hearted. Um, when my mum died, of course this this whole this search what is there accelerated. Um, and you know I when I look back now I can tell I had religion. I didn't have God. I didn't have Christ. I had religion. Now, it was as you quite rightly said. No one in my family. Um, led to believe uh, uh, a cousin who I saw every now and again, who was a lot older than me, apparently he was uh, a Christian, but I'd never had any conversation with him. And, um, and this is a remarkable thing because no one has ever witnessed to me. 
No one told me about Jesus. No one told me about the cross. So for the first 18 months or so, I was trying to work out what religion looked like. And for me, it was, you've got to be a square. You've got to be <laughs> so standish, outish as what a Wally is. Um, That's and, incredible. Uh, <laughs> good. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> You've got to tell us then, what did the square look like in the boiling hot summer of 1976? Well, you're absolutely correct there. So if someone's had a taste of the summer this year, well, that was pretty much the same for from May through to, to September. So um, I had this, um, this notion that I've got to polish my shoes. That's number one. <laughs> number two was I've got to change my hairstyle because... I cannot be looking like I'm a dude, you know. I've got to, <laughs> so I, I decided to, to put put me blazer, school blazer on, and keep it on come what may. And I had me shirt, me tie done right up to the top. And then I started to stay behind after school, putting chairs on the table and picking up litter and. I mean, when I speak to some of my mates now, they say, well, what was you doing? You know, we left you alone because you became someone else. But this was my idea of what a Christian looks like. Um, and we'd always read the sun in my house. You know, all my family were builders. They were tough men. Language was very colourful in the house. The kind of subjects that got spoke about. Um, and all of a sudden... I'm buying the times. Not only, can't, not only can't I hold it because it was a spreadsheet then, but I haven't even got a clue what he's saying. But I thought it's what Christians do. They don't look at the sun. Oh, that's <laughs> um, so I had this man-made religion and, and, and I remember because um, there was just me and my dad at home then and, and my dad went, times we were going out and he'd say i'm fed up here beep, 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 beep. spending all that time praying and i'm waiting beep, beep, car for you and all that tooting the hoop he was and everything and but i thought i've got to do it i've got to read my bible and i ain't got a clue what he's saying but you know i'm wow. doing it <laughs> um right me spoons how i mean that it you know that takes your breath away I mean, anyone listening to this now, you're just going, well, that's that's ridiculous. How did that happen to a teenage boy? And you've been thinking about religion or, or something to do before you lose your mum, you lose your mum. You then become the, the most religious bloke in South London. And yet, within a year, you go to Derby County and you're in the big boys' world of professional football, recovered from injury. By the time you're 18... You've moved north to Derby. You've had a two-year apprenticeship. I, I will come back to some of that in a moment. But, but the World Cup, for younger listeners, the World Cup of 78 was in Argentina. The top players in the world are in it, and Argentina win it. You've got Ricky Villa and Ozzy Ardiles, two of the stars of Argentina, who play for Tottenham Hotspur or Spurs. Glenn Hoddle, the best player in England, is at the World Cup and his top draw. And you, Spoons, make your first team debut back in London against Spurs in 1979, straight after the World Cup, right? Straight after the World Cup, that next year. Mm -hmm. The best yeah. players in the world in midfield. What was it like being a midfielder on your debut in London against those three within a year of the World Cup? Well, it's strange because I wasn't too worried. I mean... Remember, we left the hotel in Derby on the Friday and, and Tommy Doherty was manager. And it was just kind of so casual. He says, Spoof, by the way, you're playing tomorrow. <laughs> and I thought, what the hell? So I'm just, just dreaming all the way down the motorway. You know, I can't remember anything about the trip. I remember we stayed in in um, in London, right in the city centre, and um, and uh, what a hotel! What was it now? But anyway, I remember staying there, and um, I think I slept okay, and 
And in them days, you know, you 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 didn't have emails or anything like that. I, I remember getting some telegrams. Yes, so there's a thing, telegrams for the younger listeners. Um, and I had a couple of telegrams arrive, you know, one of my old school teachers. Wonderful. And um, I remember going to Tottenham on the coach and we've got a police escort. And I'm thinking, wow, this is incredible. So I remember getting in the, the changing rooms and, and we go out and it was, a, it was a lovely sunny day. And one of the things that I do distinctly remember was the colours, you know, and, and people. I hadn't seen thousands like this before. You know, I'd been used to playing in the, <clears throat> the old Ponting Central League in the reserves in the 18th. And uh, so to step out at White Hart Lane, I think, it was a, a relatively small crowd by what they get now, but it was like, I think it was 28,500. So that's you know, massive for a player my age. And, and all I do remember is I'm thinking the, the game started in East Rolling. Where am I going to get my next breath from? I was panting the pace of the game. Our deal is just gliding over the pitch. Uh, VR, I was struck by VR, how big he was, you know, six foot two, so strong. And and I settled down into the game so much so that the second half, um, we was we was losing 1-0. And, uh, yeah, I think it was 1-0 at the time. Anyway, it's, it's near the halfway line, and our left back throws it to me, and I, I've got it on me, me chest, I flick it up on me thigh, and I volley it back to the goalie. And it goes out for corner. And, of course, they score from the corner. <laughs> That's it. I'm thinking, oh, I've had it. I've had it. I was expecting the curly finger coming off your gum. But I stayed on, but I didn't play in the next game. I was on a sub. Um, yeah. but, but wonderful, you know. It's because um, I had my family there, you know, um, who had been with me on them, them tough days and that. So... To see them <clears throat> sitting in the stands, um, but I was I was young and naive, and I, I I didn't dedicate myself to the job as much as I should have done. So spoons, perhaps I can jump about a bit then in our interview and take you back towards the end of your career. Actually, well, not not so far off anyway. Um, you cut, you're in your thirties. Uh, you haven't yet studied coaching uh, and a life of being quite religious um, mixed with a typical footballer lifestyle, perhaps I might say, mm, uh, and yet married to the, you know, settled down then, married to Lynn, fantastic wife of over 30 years. Uh, both your children uh, have been born. Um, you hit for you, a pretty big low uh, when you're playing at Mansfield, which actually leads to you coming to a real faith in Christ, mm. which mm. has formed so much of your approach to young people in the way you just described in subsequent years. What, what happened then coming to faith? Well, um, I had, I'd never lost this belief in God. Um, I didn't know about grace. I didn't know about mercy. But just going back to when I, I left home and, and came to Derby, I thought, you ain't going to survive, mate. Being a square, you ain't going to survive. And I was living in digs with a couple of other lads. And, and of course, we, we started to go out. And then I, I got invited to try a pint of lager and lime in them days. Um, <laughs> which tasted disgusting at the time, and I was paying 25 for your pint for it. Um, 25 for your pint. <laughs> I know. It's <laughs> incredible, isn't it? Eh? You could go out and have a great night on a fiver, and that's a kebab from in as well. <laughs> and a taxi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, so I, I, I I'd found this taste of a lifestyle that I'd never been exposed to. Um. No, no one from the family watching over me. 
And, uh, and of course, then the lifestyle kicks in, nightclubs, and, of course, it's, it's made worse when I've got in the first team because I'm a right Charlie now. You know, I'm mixing with first team players. And, and as my stepmom always said to me, I had a champagne taste on beer money. <laughs> which was was very true, and um, and so I, I. The amazing thing is that I, in all this, I used to read my Bible and say my prayers, and then ashamedly go out and do everything in the Bible it says you shouldn't do. But you know, I had because I had religion, I ticked the box, and um, you know, I I done the bit what I was responsible for. Um, so going forward, uh, this had always gnawed away in my heart. And um, I remember having a chat one night with my wife and my, my sister, my brother-in-law, and, I, and I, we was living in York at the time. And I, I said, you know, I really think that I ought to start thinking about going back to church. And they said, what do you want to do that for? I said, I just feel I need it. And they said, you're a nice enough bloke. You know, you're good and you're... And I said, yeah, but there's some. So anyway, fast forward a couple more years, I didn't do anything about it. And I was talking with a player at Mansfield and, uh, you know, I don't know, I can't remember where we was, but we started talking about God and and I said, well, you know, I believe in God and I read the Bible. And they go, you? I said, yeah, me. And I think that really struck a chord in me. I thought, what do people think? What kind of person am I? Now, I knew I wasn't a, 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 someone who lived by the word, but still that cut to me. And I... Well, I suppose you're saying he's going, don't be ridiculous, not you, not the way you live. Yeah, yeah. And the, yeah that's, that's the way I'm seeing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so within, um, I forget the time span, but it was in six months, within a year of this, we... We've done well. We're at Mansfield. We we got promotion from now League Two to League One, and and we started the next season. and And I wasn't having a good time. I, I wasn't enjoying my football. And I got the opportunity to go to Blackpool on loan. Um, so I went to, to Blackpool, and first game we play in West Brom at Blackpool, and. This lad, uh, I don't know if you remember, Kevin Donovan, he's just about to take a shot and I come in from the side and take the ball away from him and he goes straight through me, straight down the ankle. I'm thinking, come on, suck it up, get on with it, you're going to be all right. So that night we went to a party and um, oh, my leg was on fire. And I've gone back to Blackpool on the Tuesday and I'm thinking, I cannot tell him I'm injured. I've just got to get on with it. And I did. And oh, I was really struggling. And then, ironically enough, the following game, the next Saturday, we got Mansfield away. And I'm thinking, there's no way I'm pulling out of that one. I have got to play it. Well, you know, they obviously thought a lot of me at Mansfield because they allowed me to play against them. <laughs> you know, most most clubs nowadays would say he can go on, but he's not playing against us. But they was all for it. <laughs> um, That's shocking. <laughs> so anyway, there, um, I've gone out for Walmart. I think I am struggling. I shouldn't be here. Started the game and went in for tackle, and never forget the ball got stuck in a fifty-fifty between my legs and him, and I tried to yank the ball away, and I just felt it surge of pain through my ankle right up the side of my leg and um, and after the game it was <sighs> so fast forward on that I I ended up having three operations on it and um, whilst in this time of um, the 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 opera sorry before the first stop I spent a lot of time at home um that's how my luck was going. I, I come, I tried to come back from it. I played a reserve game, and I fractured my ribs, oh. and I had to come off with my ankle. I now developed a cough as well, so I'm coughing all this time with these ribs. My ankle's on fire. I'm on crutches. I go with the wife to pick the kids up from school, and on my good ankle, I go over on it, 
Oh, stop it. <laughs> and I end up doing me good ankle on a wobbly bit of pavement. <laughs> so I'll never forget. I mean, I go in for surgery at Blackpool and I said to the surgeon, why are you having a look? Why are you at it? You couldn't shove a jab in the other ankle, could you? That's killing me. So, um, but prior to that, yeah, I got in a really dark place down. Really, really dark place. Dark thoughts come upon me. Um, you know, nobody knows anyone better than their self. And the inner man, you know what the inner man saying to you. And, and my conscience was on fire. Um, not because I'd done anything particularly wrong. It was just that I felt that I wasn't a right person. Um, and I then pick up the, the phone to call David Carr, who was at that time, Dave was a lay preacher and he was, he used to look after my pension and several other players' pensions. So I said, Dave, look, I explained, I said, I'm in a really bad place and I've had a taste of God. And he said to me, I explained everything to him and he said, there's a great guy in Derby give him a call and speak to him, which I did. And, and <clears throat> then I, I hear this story about this saviour who I just don't have to do anything. All that time spent praying and polishing me shoes and wearing me tie done up and that. Now I feel like I'm, I'm liberated. You know, I'm, my mind's free of the torment. Um, religion is good. You know, Christianity is good. And, um, and I then go back to Blackpool um, and, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, they don't know me that well because I, I, I'd got injured in the February and it's, this is about the April time now, so they don't really know me that well. But I'm, I'm now officially born again. And um, I start. I'm starting to go to church, and I'm, I'm, you know, life is hunky dory in terms of spiritually, but I've still got this injury to contend with. And and I spoke to one or two of the players, you know, uh, about I think one I tentatively spoke to about my my faith, but <clears throat> because predominantly my time was spent at home recovering from this this first operation that I, I ended up having. Um, and uh, I then, uh, I get offered a new contract. Strangely enough, at Blackpool, they offered me a new contract from the, the great, and bless him, he's no longer with us, Billy Eyre. And Billy died a few years after with, with cancer. He was the manager. He, he took me to Blackpool. Real rough, tough, man, rough and tough. Um, and uh, I got offered a contract, which I, I declined because they had a strict wage policy there, which was £250 a week uh, in 1993, and the rest was made up in other ways. I'm going back there to... Um, injured, I'm having to live in a guest house. I mean, the... You know, players talk about things nowadays. I, I remember going back to that guest house and having to get into bed with my kit on where I was that cold in the afternoon because they couldn't afford to put the heating on. Um, <laughs> and I thought, I'm not staying away from my family. You know, the, <clears throat> the, the kids, me, my son was 10 and my daughter was seven at the time. So... I got offered to go back to Chesterfield, but I had to, uh, to play for the, the contract. And, and when I'm going back there, part of me singing, flip, you know, I'm going back there with some of the players I played with. How am I going to get away with this Christian mark now? Um, and it was the first game, and it kind of brings me on to the story, what you were saying about laws. So Nicky Law and anyone who knows Nick in the game, Nick's uh, a fellow Londoner and he's effing and blinding and, you know, he's, he's a rough, tough man. And uh, 
we'd been at Rotherham together. So <clears throat> I go into training and see all the lads again. And the first game away, we've got Lincoln away. So I'm sitting at the back of the coach, minding my own business, looking out the window, out the old fire exit door, you know. And, I'm, and then Laws, he comes and sits behind me. Oh, sorry, by the side of me, how you doing, Spoof? You know, because some people call me Spoon, some people call me Spoof. Depends uh, uh, what club I was at. And um, anyway, Spoof, how you doing? Yeah, good, Laws, he's good. He says, uh, we, we're chatting away, and he's gone, have a look at his bird in here. And he, he's opened uh, the, the sun. So I've gone, ah, very nice. And I'm, because as it's coming out, I'm thinking, what am I going to say? So he said, very nice. I said, he said, what could now, what? He says, um, I said, very nice. He said, what do you mean, very nice? I said, why? Well, yeah, it, it, it's, it's nice. He said, you ain't one of them born again Christians. Honestly, don't know, word of my life. He's come out with that straight away. So I've gone, as a matter of fact, I am. And he's gone, no. I said, yeah. So he stands up from the back of the bus, walking down the bus, shouting, you'll never guess what, spoof's only born again Christian. So, you know, I've had some good lads nights out with these players, you know, drinking and that. And, and I'm now born again Christian. So um, that, that saved me a whole load of how am I going to get around this? And, and then, that, you know, I went into training and there was Mayfair and Penthouse put all over me peg. And I went out one day, it's all over me car and on me wing mirrors and everything. And, you know, the thing is, Dan, what I learned there is that not to pretend to be religious or pious. You know, I, I mean, I, I said to him, lad, you got to pack this in. I nearly had an accident on the way in where I then look out of out my wing mirror, you know. And and they they kind of, the initial bit goes out of the way. And, and, and I'm 33 now, so I'm, I'm a little bit more of a respected pro in the dressing room. And, and, and people then start asking you questions. Um, and it's then it's, you know, Surprise! There's one or two people interested in this, and and you end up speaking, and um, you know that's that was my journey of being born again, and um, you know I to to learn to live in grace, and and I I'm still had my struggles at times with it, as you know we've had many conversations over the years, um, but I've I've just been currently reading Galatians, and you know that's a wonderful story to to give you a kick up the backside when you're trying to get through on some works. Um, so that was the start of my journey. Um, oh, that's, that's a great, it's a great story. I mean, it's just a great story. I, I'm going to try and draw you, draw you in on that then. Um, so that's an, an incredibly long period of time from a 14 year old thinking what happens after I die to then out of the blue, losing his mum after the, Diagnosis of a brain tumour in three weeks. You move up north to Derby, you're in the first team at 18. You play a full career, 450, nearly 500 games. 33, you come to an understanding that it's a free gift not to be earned. And here you are over 20 years later where you've, you've continued to work in professional football all your life. All your working life has been in football from the highest level to non-league, you've been in all of it. It's an incredible career, Steve. And I, I think I'd like to draw you in now by saying, from what we've heard of your story of coming to faith, and we've touched a little bit on your, the way you handle young players, how has this changed you inside the business as a football man in the last 20 odd years? What are the biggest changes in your own life as you do your job that you're glad of? Um, I think one of the, the big things is <clears throat> learn to deal with adversity in a more balanced way. Um, <clears throat> just going back then, when I went to Chesterfield, they wouldn't give me a contract till I proved I was free of injury. <clears throat> and... Um, 
my ankle went again and I ended up needing two bouts of surgery when I was at Chesterfield. And, and, and I remember reading Hebrews 10 about, you know, do not throw away your confidence or it will be richly rewarded and have patience to do the will of God. And I thought, it's, but I've got to trust this is where, looking back now, is where faith <clears throat> really, <clears throat> the rubber hits the road. So in that time, you know, my wife isn't a Christian, um, wasn't, and, and, you know, wouldn't profess a faith, she professed a belief in God. Um, and so, you know, she's seen her husband who is undergone an unbelievable change of character, um, laying there, can't do his job, and there's no money coming into the house. And, and she's a real trooper for my, my wife, you know, I love it a bit. And she said, well, I'm going to have to go out to work. And she went to work at Tesco's on the checkout until we got ourselves back going again. Um, and um, and I, I went to Russian and Diamond. So, you know, in that time, Dano, I, there was periods of time out of work. Um, and I'm thinking, this is too much for me. You know, I, I can't carry this on. I'm, am I going to play again? Where am I going to earn my money? I've only ever been a footballer. And, um, you know, I just held on to my faith then and had a lot of supportive Christians, you included. Uh, you know, I met you later on after that. <clears throat> um, people that, that helped me through. And and I think I look back now and it was, it was great grounding again because two important times of my life when my mum died, I found that resilience and that character in me that I never knew existed. And then when I'm injured, I found a faith and a stability in God that has, that has kept me grounded in, in the years of times when other times have been tough because, you know, he was faithful when he brought me through and he developed me in my, my character as a Christian and as, as a person as well in them times. And, and there were some really bad times in there. I mean, you know, times I've, I've thought even on, on good times, I've thought, why did you choose me? This is too hard. Mm. You know, um, I don't know if I can carry this for you. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but, um, you know, God is good and he, he, he gave me the strength to, to get through it. And, um, and I came through and, and then I, I went to, I got an opportunity to go on trial to Rushton and Diamonds and I went and I got a contract. And um, from there I went to, to Burton and, and, and finally as playing manager at Gresley. And I, I managed Burton for a little while, for about six weeks, me and Andy Garner, which mm. I, I really enjoyed. And, uh, and um, um, when I went, when I was at Rushton, I, I had to think about the next stage of my career now. You know, um, I, I left school with no qualifications. What am I good at? And people have always told me, you know, you could sell fish to the Eskimos, you. So I thought, well, I'm going to try this sales. And I like the idea of, you know, the nice smart whistle and a car and all that, you know. And I'm thinking, that's a bit of me there. I could do a bit of that. And, but I, I couldn't get an interview. And, um, I, f I saw an advert in the, the paper in Derby for telly sales. I thought, right, well, come on, you're going to have to start at the bottom. You're going to have to get something on your CV. So I went and oh, I don't know, I hated it. I hated it. And, and I couldn't carry it on. And I subsequently got released from Rushton because injuries kicked in again. Um, I went to Burton Albion and, um, and and John Barton, who was the manager of Burton, he asked me, he asked me if I'd like to go in at Burton College. Well, I think I mentioned earlier that I had no qualifications and, and this is so daunting for me going into an educational establishment. <clears throat> but and then uh, I say I, I, I was coaching part time at Derby and, and this is where I thought, you know, this is this is what I wanted. I couldn't say that 
I was 100% in love with it um, because I'd only ever been a player. And, and I thought, well, this is what I know best and this is, will give me a chance in the future. So I threw myself into <clears throat> coaching and, and went through the coaching qualifications, uh, got my A licence, and, uh, and then I started on uh, the coaching ladder at, at uh, full-time at, at Russian and Diamonds in, I think it was 1999, September 99 I started. So in some ways, uh, you know, that's, it's, a, it's a sort of, you might call it a coincidence in human speak, isn't it? You, mm. you, you, the door opened to a career which, which presumably would have been, you know, that was a big jump for you to be doing studies and school. Uh, did that help you with your coaching qualifications in a substantial way? Did your faith have well, anything to do with that period? Well, well um, I remember going to see Cannon and Bull. Um, they spoke at our church um, when they were born again. And he said a great word that someone, he said, we don't have an agent now because we say to people, we've got the best agent in the world and he doesn't take 10%. And, you know, it's, it's a basic trust. I know, you know, that I just trust him to open doors for me. Um, <clears throat> and when it's right, you walk through. If you feel that it's not, you don't, or God would put up the, you know, I tended to work on the traffic lights, you know, if there's enough evidence, it's green, you go. If it's not, then you stay because <clears throat> God has given us a brain as well and there's times where we have to step out in faith and I think he expects us to use it. And, um, you know, that was a good piece of advice I was given by Gordon Neal. So my, my, my life has been based around trusting God and there were times when I was out of work and I thought, you know, I ain't so sure about this. But I'd read something, you know, um, or I'd see something. And, and I've got notes probably like we all have in, in pieces of paper or in books when I felt like that. And, and I've gone – and I, I know where I was when I was thinking them thoughts and I go back and I picture the whole day. And it's just – you know, been about when I look back on my coaching career now and, and see how God has led me on the bus. And I know for sure that I wouldn't have been a, a, a coach and be a coach that's, that's done okay um, at, at my level um, if it wasn't for God, because on my own, I, I wouldn't have had them kind of qualities that I think exist in me because. My life is based on the Bible and a Christ-like life. Steve Spooner, a great joy. Um, speak to you a lot, but speaking to you for this podcast has been a tremendous privilege. I hope as you've listened uh, to Steve chatting away, uh, you've really found things that can help you if you're a parent of a young child in the elite performance pathways. You've seen the coach's perspective on their lives and what a good coach tries to do. You've seen a person who's had to transgress tremendous adversity as a young teenager and reestablish themselves. You've seen somebody who's had to build a career, typical injuries that affect so many top athletes, coming back from injuries, retirement, having to find a way to build a new career, having to make a living with children, and still years if I may say so, years and years after starting out as a teenager, here's a man who still works in the game, has a huge heart, believing in the God who gave him his talents and how that works out in his passion for the people he works with, for integrity, for care, for generosity of spirit. Uh, a tremendous privilege to interview a man like that. If you want to follow up on any of the Christians in Sport podcasts, get any podcast app and write in Christians in Sport and you'll find a number of podcasts that will help you think about faith and sport and I hope stimulate you either towards faith or to establishing your own faith. If you are an elite athlete or a parent of an elite athlete or a coach, 
uh, in the world of sport, which is demanding in the way that you've heard from Steve Spooner, just get hold of us on christiansinsport.org.uk and we'll be able to help you pretty much in any way that you'd like help to think about sport and faith. As ever, a tremendous joy to be part of this podcast and to be hanging out with my mates in audio. Good you can't see me, it's much better. Uh, Spoons is a looker. You can tell that from his story. I'm not. So that's why we do it on audio. I look forward to seeing you next time. All the best.